Hello everybody, Eternal Flame here, and today we are back with the Full Potential series. Yeah, that's right, we are back today to do the Full Potential series, where today we are going to try and advance the entirety of Kyoto High in order to not make them absolute garbage so they aren't going to be memed on. We are just going to mainly be talking about the combatants today, so we are actually doing this a different approach than how I normally do it. The normal way I do my full potential series is we specifically target the technique and not actually the person, and we focus on creating the best user of the technique as possible. I don't feel like doing that today because I want to be nice to Kyoto High. Rather than creating a better user of the technique so we can see how good the technique would be and just how trash them we are as people, I want to try improving them themselves as sorcerers in order to make the technique as best as possible. However, there's going to be something else special about this video that's going to be very different from how I would usually do these types of videos, which is the other sorcerers are going to be allowed to help each other. This is going to impact some sorcerers dramatically, while others are just going to get more minor impacts, but all of them are going to get impacts, which are going to make a lot of sense the more and more I get into this video. Basically, if you want an in-lore explanation, Utihime felt like their performance back during the Goodwill Festival was embarrassing, and also just consider this a timeline where Mechamaru got away to tell Gojo, and Gojo was able to arrive on time before Maito and Kenjaku could kill him, and those two are dead, so basically the Cohen games never happened in this timeline. Now, the order I'm planning to cover these sorcerers are going to go as followed. First, I'm going to go with Miwa, then Momo, then Kamo, then Toto, then Mai, then Mechamaru, and then finally I'm going to go into how teamwork affects all of this and how it's going to help advancing all of them. There are also going to be chapters in the video if you want to skip over certain characters. However, let's get started. Now up first is Miwa, and I'm not going to waste too much time on Miwa, mainly because we already know what a full potential Miwa should be, and that's literally just Kusakabe. In other words, we just need to make Miwa into a Kusakabe while keeping a good mentality rather than having Kusakabe's mentality, and you get a pretty good sorcerer. The main reason why I think keeping a good mentality is important is mainly because of the fact that Kusakabe has a lot of self-doubt about himself, and he just doesn't think of himself as that strong. So yeah, just have Miwa become Kusakabe. Now this will be very, very hard to achieve, but if you are able to pay Ui Ui and Mei Mei enough, which I think should be possible considering the combined funds of Mechamaru and Mechamaru's ability to hack, as well as Kamo and his resources should be able to find a way to pay Mei Mei enough. And because we already know where Kusakabe is, this would put Miwa at grade 1 level if she can achieve the level of Kusakabe. Of course, it's not entirely sure if she can or not, but if she does somehow manage to achieve it, that would be her full potential, which for the sake of this video, we are assuming that she can achieve it, mainly because we're being generous to Kyoto High. Now up next for Momo, what should we have Momo work on in order to advance her abilities? Well number one, let's go over what her actual curse technique is because I'm pretty sure a bunch of people did forget what her curse technique was. Even I forgot and I actually had to google it before this video. Her technique allows her to telepathically control items. She mainly uses it to control a broom. She has also been shown the ability to carry other people on her broom as well, and she can carry her own weight on the broom and continue to use that to fly. Finally, she's also capable of launching out wind slashes and wind gusts out from her broom. It is also somewhat implied that Momo has to take on the weight of the objects herself, however that's not fully certain yet. So how would we improve Momo? Well first I think it's pretty obvious that we're going to need to improve the amount of curse energy they have, their refinement, as well as their ability to carry things. The easiest way to help with their refinement is to get them to land a black flash. Of course nobody can land a black flash at will, but trying to train to at least be able to unlock the black flash ability is still going to help nonetheless. With that being said, I doubt that Momo is actually going to be able to land the Black Flash, if I'm going to be honest. However, them improving on their physical capabilities as well as their curse energy will be essential. Now, up next, we're going to alter the tools that Momo carries with her. Mainly because, as you guys can tell, just carrying around a broom that you fly on is not good for combat. Now, yes, I do know Momo's entire main purpose is just being surveillance and helping people out in order to make sure that they are aware of what situation they're going to get into, but it would be better for Momo to have more things in order for her to serve as better support. Now, we don't know for sure if Momo is able to manipulate several items, however, I am going to say that she is, mainly because we've already seen people who are capable of manipulating several items and sending them on different paths. So look at Kamo Norotoshi, who's able to send several arrows in different directions, for example. Now, of course, I don't think Momo can manipulate tens or even hundreds of objects at once, but even a few objects is going to help her severely in comparison to just having one object, which is a broom. For example, you could have Momo carrying around several stones in order to manipulate that and launch out more attacks at opponents. That would also be able to launch out more wind sives out from each of the stones. Like imagine Momo just having a large amount of stones floating up in the air and they all are launching wind sives at an opponent. You could also do this potentially with arrows or you could do this with blades. You can do this with a bunch of weapons in order to give Momo a lot more versatility and just constantly bombard opponents with attacks from the air and from close range as well. You also could go full Grammy and give Momo a bunch of guns going guns ablazing and manipulating them through tool manipulation to fire. Rather than just them having one gun, you can have several guns. 
You also have the advantage of the fact that bullets are pretty effective against sorcerers, mainly because of the fact that they don't have curse energy infused into them. Now, it won't be really good against people that are high level, like grade 1s and above, but it will still be very useful against sorcerers and curses. Of course, for curses, you need to infuse curse energy into the bullets, but nonetheless, it would still be pretty effective. However, we're not done yet. This is when we're going to get into a specific set of tools and a binding vow that I have in mind for Momo. Where for Momo, I want her to start infusing cursed energy into several arrows. However, these arrows have a very unique purpose, as these arrows are not mainly made to be used in combat other than for one-time move things, as it's going to have a very similar binding vow to the binding vow Mei Mei has placed on her crows, where once these arrows land on an opponent, they will immediately get destroyed in order to get a massive buff to their power when they land on somebody. This is all mainly to help with Momo's battle power and making her that much more effective of a combatant. Now, yes, she could add cursed tools to her arsenal, but I legit don't know if she actually could afford to get the cursed tools that would actually be good. Like, they could get pre-made cursed tools, but I don't think she could afford to get any that is actually worthwhile. I think with all this, we can get Momo to the pretty high tiers of semi-grade 1. I don't think that she's going to surpass semi-grade 1, mainly because there are limits to what she can really do, but I do think we can get her all the way up to semi-grade 1. However, that's not too bad considering Momo's main purpose is literally to be support. Now up next is Combo Noritoshi, and this is going to be one of the shorter sections of the video. Not because I don't have a lot to talk about with Blood Manipulation, but that's because I have kind of already made two videos going over the full potential of Blood Manipulation. One going over what a Blood Manipulation domain would be like, and another going over what the full potential of Blood Manipulation would be like in the very specific context of a human using it and not Death Painting using it. So I'm going to just go over a very quick summary of everything that I said in that video, but I'm also going to include something else, which is an idea I got from you guys in the comments because one of you people are just straight up a monster. You know who you are when I get to your idea. However, if you want a more detailed explanation on the ability itself, go check out the original video of what is the full potential of blood manipulation. So of course, starting out, we need to get combo access to reverse curse technique. While it won't be as good at converting your own curse energy into blend, you'll need to use RCT instead. It'll be better than Kamo dying out from blood loss. Up next, instead of carrying blood bags around, Kamo is going to end up creating several Shikigami in order to store his blood in. Basically, consider this Kamo taking inspiration after fighting Megami and deciding, you know what, Megami has these Shikigami. I'm going to try and make my own Shikigami since they are clearly so useful for him, and it's what gave him the advantage in our fight. This also ends up helping to counter one of the main weaknesses of blood manipulation being its weakness to water, mainly because if it's stuck inside of a Shikigami, water won't be able to touch it as easily. Then use the Shikigami as shells in order to prepare techniques inside of the Shikigami. Also a reminder, because a lot of people don't know this, it is possible for anybody to create a Shikigami. Gojo said that a while back to Yuji, back when Yuji was figuring out about Curse Energy. Sure, it's simple Shikigami, but Kamo has access to a Curse Technique, which is going to make them that much better. And I have a couple Shikigami ideas in mind. One Shikigami is going to be just a pretty large Shikigami that's only purpose is going to be carrying blood for Kamo to use. Another Shikigami is going to have piercing blood infused into it where it can only fire out piercing bloods, which I imagine basically being a dragonfly. And because of that, it's going to have a binding vow on top of it, which is going to end up amping the piercing blood since that's the only technique it can use. And then a final Shikigami in the background, which main purpose is going to be charging up a very powerful attacks, while Kamo, as well as his Dragonfly Shikigami, continue to fight and put pressure on the main opponent from the front. For Kamo's technique of Slicing Exorcism, we're going to advance it by taking advantage of Choso's usage of it, where it's also just going to be thin lines of blood to slice at people, while at the same time still using the entire shuriken that Kamo makes, mainly because both applications are pretty good to use. Furthermore, you can also include occasional binding vows in order to make piercing blood that much stronger by amping up the amount of time it needs to charge up, because it does need some time to charge in order to compress the blood to be fired out properly. Up next is Flowing Red Scale Stack, where the way that I would amp up Flowing Red Scale and Flowing Red Scale Stack is by amping up the property that allows them to heat up their body. I wouldn't constantly heat up their body, but I would make it so Kamo for moments of time massively heats up their body in order to do burning damage as well on top of the physical damage that they do whenever they touch opponents. We see that Kamo was able to amp up the heat of their body because that's how Choso was able to melt through Arame's ice. Now, of course, it's going to have high risk as a technique, but that's just going to make the technique that much better because we can turn that into binding vows. Now, of course, there is the possibility that Kamo might have access to the ability to manipulate blood in other people, but I don't think that's too likely. I think they have to be dead people at best, assuming he can even manipulate blood in other people, but I think it is potentially possible. However, what I think is even more interesting is the domain expansion we are going to give Kamo, as I think if any character is going to be fitting of having a domain expansion, it's going to be one of the inheritors of the big three families being Kamo himself. And I think one of the most fitting domain expansions for Kamo Noritoshi to have access to is a sure hit that allows him to manipulate the blood in other people and force them to stand still, basically on a full-on Katara-type beat from Avatar. 
and then start to go crazy on them with techniques. However, now I'm gonna go into one of the techniques that you guys came up with because y'all are downright monsters. And the technique that you guys came up with was for Kamo to go to the hospital and find infected blood. Mainly because if Kamo can find infected or diseased blood and use that as a tact, that's just going to make Kamo that much more dangerous and that much more of a menace for most people to fight, mainly because 90% of the verse can't heal poisons. I want y'all to remember, poisons are considered a higher level of RCT than the standard level of RCT. Ultimately, at the end, I would consider this combo to be on par with Choso. The domain expansion would put him a tier above Choso, so he should likely be in the high-end grade 1 terms of tier, and that would also be his ranking because I don't see him soloing a nation, but he's still going to be insanely strong nonetheless. However, the two were to fight, unfortunately, I still see Choso ultimately winning, mainly because Kamo shouldn't have immunity to Choso's poison, while at the same time, Choso should be fine against Kamo's poison that he is going to have access to through his blood. Of course, that is excluding the possibility of Kamo using his domain. If Kamo were to use his domain, I do think he'd win. Also, before we go over to Toto, if you like full potential videos like this, we got a lot more on the channel, and it would help a lot if you just click that little subscribe button down below. Anyways, we're gonna get into Toto now. Aoi Toto, the man with over 500,000 IQ, an absolute genius who already uses his curse technique extremely well. However, there are probably some ways we can advance his curse technique. Unlike the others, we don't really need to advance Toto's physical stats, mainly because Toto is already at a really, really good position in terms of physicals. Like at most, all we need to do is teach Toto RCT and that will significantly help Toto, but other than that, he is really good in terms of combat as a physical combatant. However, now we're going to focus on Toto's technique and how to make Toto's technique significantly better. Up first, we're going to get some inspiration from a Naruto character known as Minato, where we're going to have Toto start to carry around a bunch of objects to swap around with him. Now, I'm not going to say kunai, but I am going to say either rocks in order to make it so they're easier to displace that just have a bunch of curse energy infused into them, rather than him having to pick up random things on the road, or it could just be things like daggers in order to tell people into them. One of the biggest issues that exists with Aoi Toto is the fact that he doesn't really have much to swap with in normal fights, depending on who he's fighting against. So if Toto can carry around a bunch of things to swap with, this will end up significantly helping him, mainly because it will become much harder to predict him. Furthermore, it can also end up painting the image that he can only swap with those things that he brought in people's curse energy and not people's attacks. This also will be significant to help with the other thing that we're going to grant Toto, which is the Vibra Slap. We're just going to say that Toto's going to infuse Curse Energy and basically make the Vibra Slap as part of himself by duct taping it to his hand. And some of you guys might be wondering, why would that work? And I'm just saying, if Toto can attach the Vibra Slap to the nub on his hand and that be counted as his hand, then he can duct tape it to his hand and still be counted as his hand. This also makes Toto having a bunch of items that he carries around with him to swap with that much more significant because he will have the Viber Slap that allows him to do 50 swaps per second and now he can just throw around a bunch of items and make it look like he is disappearing. In a similar tactic to what he did with Yuji to make it look like Yuji had a bunch of shadow clones, he can do that himself now with a bunch of random items that he carries around with him that is of cursed energy infused into it. You can even have Toto carry around swords and throw the swords up into the air and jump at one of them before clapping, causing someone else to get impaled through a sword. Like, the more items that Toto carries around with him, the better, because Toto can become straight up devious if he teleports people into those items. We also know this is very in character for Toto to do, considering Toto literally clapped and made Hanami swap places with him and get impaled by their own attack. Now, I'm not going to give Toto a domain expansion, mainly because I have absolutely no idea what Toto's domain expansion would even do and how to make that work. However, I do have a way that might actually make Toto's technique significantly more broken. However, I'm not fully sure if this is actually possible. Now up first, I do want to establish that the power of the person Toto is swapping with does not matter at all. After all, there are people Toto has swapped with that are significantly stronger than him, mainly because we know Toto is capable of swapping with Sakuna, who Sakuna is much more powerful than Toto. So that is something very, very important to establish with what I'm about to say. Now you might be wondering, how am I going to make Toto's technique so much more broken? And it's quite simple really. Toto has to target curse energy that he swaps with. Why not just target only half of the curse energy that he can sense rather than the full thing? So basically, here's my thing that I want to suggest. Have Toto, instead of clapping and swapping the full object, have him only clap and swap places with like half of a person. This would have the capability of one-shotting most people. Now, I do think this would have a power requirement to it, mainly because it is forcefully separating parts of the body from another person just off their curse energy alone, so Toto would probably have to be stronger than them, but at the same time, I'm not too sure, mainly because of the world's cutting slash. 
because all the world cutting slash is doing is just targeting something else which is targeting everything in existence and that's why it's able to cut through gojo so i believe you could make an argument that this application of toto's technique would just follow under that same line of course if you don't think it's possible or if you think that it would require a power argument to it then i'm fine with that but at the same time we are going over what the full potential of toto could be so ultimately, this Toto would be much stronger than his canon counterpart because he carries around a bunch of things to swap with. And if this application ends up being true, then Toto is easily special grade level, mainly because if he can do this to 50 times a second to random people, he is taking over a nation no problem. But that only depends on if this technique and version of the technique is even possible, which I'm kind of not certain about. So if it is possible, Toto is certainly on the special grade rank, but if it's not possible, Toto is probably just a bit stronger than he is in canon. Now I do admit I wish I could have made this section longer, but Toto is one of the few people who really use their technique to their pinnacle, so it's really hard to think on better ways to use Toto's technique that Toto hasn't already thought of himself. Now up next is going to be my Zenin, who actually is the main reason why I'm even making this video to begin with, because this part of the video is sponsored by someone else's super chat who donated $5 for me to specifically talk about my Zenin and her full potential, so we are going to go crazy with how far we can pull my. Now up first, I do need to establish this. Yorozu is not Mai's full potential. While Yorozu might be the full potential in terms of physicality, output, all that good jazz, that's what they are the full potential in. They are not the full potential in terms of creation abilities and what they can create. As because of one thing needs to be established, the difference between Mai and Yorozu, which is the eras they were born in. Now, the main reason why I believe the eras they're born in is so important is because of one tool that Maya has access to that is stronger than any tool Yorozu has access to that is going to really help her creation ability. And that tool is the internet. Now, some of you guys might think I'm memeing right now, but I'm really not, because I want you all to remember something. Yorozu's from over 1,000 years ago. They did not have the internet, they did not have catalogs of information like they do now, and basically all the information that Yorozu used in order to make her bug armor, I guarantee you, Mai can just Google in like an hour or two hours and she'd get it done. The main reason why I think this is so important to establish is because Yorozu had much more limited amount of information and she still managed to get incredibly far, down to the point where several people consider her top 10. So, we're now giving someone who has much more access to information than Yorozu does a much bigger kit because they have easier access to information. So, I hope you all understand why I'm saying Yorozu's creation abilities that she has shown off is not the peak of the verse or anywhere close to that. Mai could potentially go much greater than Yorozu and I'm going to explain how this is going to affect her entire capabilities. Now, there is also something else that needs to be important as well. The reason why Maki could not get stronger at all was because Mai did not want to get stronger. She never trained. In this, we're altering Mai's mentality a bit to make her need to train more. Basically, we're just going to change Mai's mentality because while she doesn't want to be involved in the life of a Jujutsu Sorcerer, she is aware of cursed spirits and the best way for her to have a normal life is for her to get strong enough to actually earn that normal life. This also ends up accidentally helping Maki funnily enough, but that's not important. The main thing that is important for this is the fact that Mai is not going to be limited in her training because Maki also is going to not be limited in her training as well because Maki is going to keep training. And now there is something else important to note, which is the limitations that Mai herself said that she was only capable of. She can't make objects that are too big, and she can't make complex things. Now I think both of these limits are more so limits on the fact that Mai never trained, and that was all she could make on her final death or her current skill allowed her to make. Mainly because she never trained seriously, which is what we're going to change in this in order to make her have wider reserves of curse energy to make her that much stronger. However, up first we are going to apply something we learned from Yorozu to Mai Zenin. Yorozu is capable of creating an armor that carries several traits from bugs and applies them to a human body. The reason why she mainly targeted insects was because of how energy efficient insects actually are, so she decided to copy several traits from insects from the fact that several insects exist that are able to carry several hundreds of their own strength, two insects capable of flying overseas in a few goes, two several insects that would fly much faster than their body would look like they are capable of flying. And then after taking the systems from insects, she directly applies it to an armor that amplifies her human traits to have those same functions. Which we are going to take advantage of, starting with an insect that I find very very interesting, known as the Diabolical Ironclad Beetle. And that is mainly to help with her durability. This is mainly because the Ironclad Beetle is capable of taking 39,000 times its average body weight. So if we put that on my Zenin and enhance that with Curse Energy to make it even more powerful, then yeah, you're going to get something that's incredibly durable and very, very hard to break through as an armor set. After that, in order to help with my speed, we're going to give Mai the power of the Australian Tiger Beetle and add that to her armor set that she's going to craft. 
And for those of you wondering why we're gonna give her this instead of something like a cheetah, for example, the Australian tiger beetle is capable of moving 171 times its body length per second. Now, some of you guys might be thinking that these bug insect traits shouldn't apply to Mai because Mai is the size of a human. Normally, I would agree with you if it wasn't for the fact that this is literally how Yorozu's armor works. Yorozu's armor applies the bug insect traits to herself in order to amplify her strength, speed, and durability by that same amount that bugs do it to themselves. And now we're going to do that with Mai Zenin. However, like I said, Mai is the advantage of being able to get this information near immediately. Like, googling these two insects took me a couple minutes in order to do that, in order to add that to Mai's armor set, and there is still much more we can do with that because she's going to apply a lot more insect traits to her armor that she's going to craft. For example, we're going to give Mai Zenin access to Spider Silk as well, which Spider Silk is five times the tensile strength as Steel, which is going to be much more useful for someone of Mai Zenin's size because Mai is a human in terms of size. So now we're going to give her that as attacks and ways to hold people down. Also, we're going to go full Spider-Man and give Mai Zenin the ability to climb walls and stick to walls as well. Speaking on the topic of spiders though, we're going to also give her access to the Venom of the Brown Recluse Spider, which is by far and away one of the most toxic, dangerous Venoms that currently exist. I know there are other dangerous Venoms, but this is just the immediate one that I can find, and its Venom is so deadly that it's going to require immediate retention at least sometimes, which of course for some sorcerers considering most of them can't actually heal poisons, is going to be very deadly, especially because Mai can heavily increase the size of the Venom as well. However, who's to say we need to stop at insects, because there are a lot more deadly things that exist in the world that if Mai can figure out how to recreate the systems and add to her armor, it will make them that much more deadly. For example, you can add the poison from the Deathstalker as well, one of the most deadliest scorpions that exist in the world with one of the most deadliest venoms. Now, I'm not going to go across every single animal that I really want to add, mainly because I know I can't find them all, which is why I want to see what you guys think in the comment section down below on what we can add to this armor to make it more and more broken, because that is the thing I want to push home. With my Zenin and the creation technique, the sky is the limit. Whatever you can find can potentially be created with enough time. Now, yes, she says that her limit is that she can only create simple things, but at the same time, based on everything we see, it's more so a skill limit because of Yorozu rather than it actually being just an outright limit on her technique and what it is capable of. Which is also supported by the narrator text as well, saying that it's more so Mai Zenin not having a lot of cursed energy rather than it actually being a problem on terms of her actual ability to create. Furthermore, we can also copy Yorozu's liquid metal plan, however we can go a step further with that. Why not create liquid metal that is coated in poison so that whenever you touch the liquid metal, it ends up poisoning you? If that's too much for you, you can also just create poisonous gas or several types of gases that most sorcerers aren't going to be prepared to fight. After all, most sorcerers, like I have repeated in this video several times over, do not have an immunity to poison. That is a high level of RCT that most sorcerers just don't have access to. While it's more useful against sorcerers than curses, it's still going to be rather useful against them too. However, even now, we're not even going as far as we possibly can. So let's step into the realm of science and technology for a minute, allowing Mai to push herself even further. Now, this definitely would take a lot of time, but I do think it is possible with time. And if we do that, what's to stop Mai Zenin from becoming a full-on war machine and adding that to her arsenal? Imagine herself giving herself jet boosters in order to help what's already going to be an amazing level of speed that she is going to have access to, or grenade launchers or bullets directly created on the armor itself. Or even giving her heat-seeking missiles, making some weird combination of bug armor fused in with several of a man's greatest technology, a fusion of nature and man making this perfect weapon for Mai to have access to. And the craziest part about all of this is it wouldn't disappear upon being created because of how Mai's technique works. When something is created, it doesn't disappear, so it would just take time and effort to add all of this together to eventually create the perfect weapon for her to use. Now, this does result in probably a bunch of prototypes being made as well. However, that's going to be important for the teamwork section of this, so we're going to leave that there, but keep that in mind, there are going to be a bunch of prototypes too. However, mainly because they're not going to be working alone, I also can see Mai having an easier time working with this because they're going to have access to the genius that is Mechamaru. And now I'm going to attempt to push Mai's technique even further into the limits beyond what I've already done. And this is going to be probably the craziest thing I'm going to do for Mai Zenny, but I want y'all to remember something about Yorozu. Yorozu, upon being pushed heavily enough to do so, was capable of creating an impossible concept, that being a perfect sphere, because perfect spheres just straight up don't make sense and wouldn't work in real life. 
So what if Mai figured out how to recreate the process of making nukes? Now, of course, I don't think she would ever actually use this ability. However, what if she just had in her arsenal the ability to recreate nukes, which I do think is something possible with enough time and studying for her to figure out how to recreate a nuke. It would definitely take a lot of time, but I do think she could eventually figure it out. However, that's going to be the end of where I'm going to reach for for Mai and Mai's full potential. However, unlike most characters where I'm pretty confident I have thought of a lot of ways to push them, I think I've only scratched the barrel of what's capable of Mai's technique, mainly because Mai has one of the most broken techniques in all of Jujutsu Kaisen. With enough information, enough curse energy control, and enough studying, it can really be pushed to its limits. But it is definitely a cursing that is only going to get stronger and stronger the more and more time that passes, mainly because with more and more time we're just going to discover more and more things to make it even more insane, which is why I only scratch the surface of this, if that. However, ultimately, at the end of this, I do think Mai would be given the rank of special grade, mainly because I think y'all can tell just based on the amount we have given Mai and those destructive abilities, if she has access to all of this, yeah, no country is standing a chance against her. And now we're going to move on to Mechamaru. Now Mechamaru is also going to have a rather short section. Not because I don't have a lot of ideas for Mechamaru, but a bunch of the ideas I already have for Mechamaru were already done in one of Broken Ronin's video of the full potential of Mechamaru where he did it. And I don't really want to copy all of the ideas that he made, so I'm just going to link you guys his video rather than regurgitating his ideas. However, to summarize those very quickly, one idea he had was basically for him to turn into Iron Man and wear one of the Mechamaru suits as his own while fighting alongside his own Mechamaru suits. He would also end up carrying several Mechamarus that are just the normal Mechamarus with no special abilities, as well as several of the normal Mechamarus that carry the uh, actual special abilities that they have access to normally. Finally, they would also wield the ultimate Mechamaru suit. However, there's something that I think you can do even more for Mechamaru, which is instead of going bigger, you can go smaller. And what I mean by that is quite simple. Imagine tens to hundreds of Mechamarus that are really, really small, like the size of insects that are each carrying small little bombs or small little lasers, and you have them fly at opponents in order to make them explode. Sure, the damage isn't going to be major, but enough of these are going to end up overwhelming people. On that note, I also ended up getting some inspiration from Hell Divers and the Hulk units from the Automatons, and we're just effectively going to give Mechamaru a couple of those. Mainly because I think they would be really good tanky support for whoever is fighting alongside Mechamaru. Mechamaru would end up being a really, really good support type sorcerer. Now, I do also think at the end of this, Mechamaru would more than likely end up being special grade as well. This is mainly because Mechamaru pretty easily can take over a country, mainly because he can make an army himself. And if Ghetto can be counted as special grade because he can make an army by absorbing enough cursed spirits, Mechamaru can be counted as special grade for that same reason. There are also some other drone ideas I have in mind as well. For example, normal Mechamarus who carry bombs inside of them that just fly at opponents and explode, and those types of Mechamarus, a bunch of Mechamarus just carrying other standard weapons rather than having curse energy infused weapons, which is mainly to be used against other sorcerers rather than curses. However, you could still infuse a little bit of curse energy into them in order to make them suitable against curses and actually able to properly put them down, because we know you can imbue items with curse energy. However, that's all the ideas I have for Mechamaru, at least Mechamaru on his own. However, this is where we're going to enter into the teamwork section and why teamwork is so important for Kyoto High in particular. Up first, I'm going to talk about the first work of teamwork I foreshadowed a little bit, which is going to be between Mechamaru and Mai Zenin. Now, I want you all to remember something I said about Mai's armor, which is the fact that Mai's armor is going to have a lot of prototypes and backup husks. Well, those husks aren't going to be standing around being wasted and doing nothing. No, they're going to be given to Mechamaru in order for Mechamaru to create his own drones. Now, I want y'all to imagine this. My Zenin's armor that she had created custom with that much amount of power, being aided by Mechamaru's science genius and being controlled by Mechamaru. Or to put it even better, a better version of Yorozu's armor being controlled by Mechamaru with the Curse Energy Cannons being added into that as well. This will probably just become the main Mechamaru body as well once Mechamaru figures out how to fit in his electronics like an animatronic from Five Nights at Freddy's. But once he does, oh boy, this is going to become a monster to fight against and there are likely going to be several of these things lying around that Mechamaru can upgrade and have fun with. Also, if you think Mai creating her own guns and adding that to the suit was too much, then Mechamaru can just create the guns and add it to the suit for her instead. Now, it wouldn't allow her to create it on the spot, but it would still be pretty useful for her to have as that would allow her to skip that step. 
Up next for the teamwork section of things, we're going to go with Mechamaru and Toto. Mechamaru can very easily create several bombs for Toto to carry around with him, so when he collapses, he can swap places with the bombs and make somebody instantly get hit by the bombs. If we assume that Mai is also capable of creating bombs, then she can do the exact same thing, making total swaps that much more deadly, especially because they have cursed energy infused into them and cause shrapnel that will allow much more things for Toto to swap with as well. Mechamaru can also create suits for all people in Kyoto High in order to amp up their physical stats and abilities more. Now, of course, for some of these people, it would be a much more minor buff in comparison for others, like me will be a major buff, but Toto, it would be a minor buff. However, it would still be a buff nonetheless and still be pretty helpful. This is especially the case for Momo, considering Momo's still going to be the weakest one of this entire team, so her having as much of a buff from Mechamaru's armor just being around her will significantly help her. Furthermore, they could also make it so Mechamaru's armor is allows her to fly, rather than her needing to use a broomstick which will allow her to conserve some of her cursed energy and direct it mainly to fighting. Furthermore, you could also potentially give Momo some canisters that are containing either Simple Domain or several Ultimate Mechamaru Cannons that would be able to be fired from the heavens as support from Momo directly. Mechamaru could also potentially end up creating Lightning Gauntlets for Kamo. As a result of that, it would allow him to send lightning through his blood, doing shock damage on top of that because blood is an amazing conductor. Now, while there are definitely other team ways of fighting that I can think of, this is mainly the main things that I can think of in order to help each other's kits individually just from extra items from support. However, the most interesting thing I want to say now is where I think I would rank each of these people based on their no full potential states from weakest to strongest. And the order would go Momo at the weakest, then Miwa is up next, after that would be Kamo and Orotoshi, after Kamo would be Mechamaru, then after Mechamaru would be a tie between Mai and Toto. Now if you do think Toto is capable of swapping only half of a person rather than the full person, Toto would be above Mai, however if you don't think that is the case, I would put Toto below Mechamaru. But still, I think we did pretty well, considering we were able to upgrade three of the people to special grades, and the others to really high-end grade ones other than Momo, who's a semi-grade one, but we still did pretty well. However, if you guys want to see more full potential videos like this, then be sure to subscribe, we got a lot more on the way, and just anime content in general. Also, comment down any videos you want to see me make in the future. I'ma see y'all later, peace out, have a good day.